As soon as the year is over, people tend to look back and see what the year has brought and so do I. So these are my top games of 2018. I can already spoil that God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2 are not on my list. They are also not on PC. Despite being very good games, other games were more interesting and more fun for me last year. One in particular was simply outstanding this year. Still, we will talk a bit about those two later in the video. Personally, I'm not a big fan of award shows in general and for me the ideal show would discuss in detail why a specific game, film or whatever has won. And that's what I'll try this time. My second most played game and my third favorite of last year is Soul Calibur 6. The newest Soul Calibur title is a 3D fighting game. I like watching fighting games in general and to some degree playing them too. I love Tekken 7 and Street Fighter 4 and 5, but as someone who struggles a lot with execution in this genre, Soul Calibur has always been one of my favorite fighting games to play. I started with Soul Blade on the PlayStation 1, originally called Soul Edge in Japan and on Arcade. What impressed me back in the day was the use of weapons and it had a ton of good single player content too, where you could unlock for example secret characters that briefly appeared in a cutscene and you never expected them to be actually playable characters in the game. When I unlocked them I was quite flashed. The next entry was for Dreamcast and Arcades called Soul Calibur. It really looked impressive back in the day. Due to the Dreamcast's weak sales and Sega's problems, Soul Calibur 2 became a multi-platform title for PlayStation 2, Xbox and GameCube. The strength of the series is that it's easy to get into because most characters are not that execution heavy, at least on an average player level. In addition, animations and graphics were amazing throughout the series, so it always looked cool even if you just randomly meshed buttons. It had many flashy moves that looked nice and impactful, plus the ring out mechanic that added some tension. I also really liked these string trails that follow your weapon during an attack, making the movement of attacks in 3D space easier to understand. In addition, it looked cool, a really smart idea. And if you just want to play a bit alone, without getting competitive, the series often had, as mentioned, great single player content too. All this is present in Soul Calibur 6 again. You could argue about the single player content, but it's much better than 5 in this regard for sure. Soul Calibur 6 has a great number of offensive options until you play against really good players having superior defense with certain control characters who block and punish every tiny unsafe move you do. But no matter how good or bad you are, in most cases fights look cool, at least to those playing. There is something about the game's style that simply works well and looks fun. I think the visuals and animations are clean. Special moves often find a good balance between epic totally over the top and plausible martial arts like within the game's rules and fantasy world. Of course, the game is not realistic at all. With some attacks you really feel the impact, but no matter how over the top they are, the movement is easy to follow and it makes you want to try the game yourself. In contrast, as a pure spectator experience, even on high level, it's not that interesting to watch in my opinion. I think at higher levels of play you can see that the game and even the series has some problems here and there that other fighting games solve better. I remember that Soul Calibur 4 had a few characters that could ring out you from the middle of the stage with a combo and many fights on stages with ring outs evolved around this. But this is just one example of older days and I think the games are far more fun to play than to watch. After Soul Calibur 5, which was released early 2012, the series took a long break and some considered it almost dead. SC5 for example replaced most of the classic beloved characters of the series with different but younger characters, who look different but have basically the same moves and fighting styles. The next generation you could say. So for example instead of Taki you got Natsu, which is basically Taki just looking different. This made not too many people happy even though the game was actually fun and seemed relatively well balanced. In Soul Calibur 6 we got the classic character roster back, of course some beloved characters are still missing and we also got the first PC port of the whole series, which is actually quite good for the most part from my perspective. 
Online works quite well with some bugs. I like that you can spectate other players' fights while you are waiting for your turn in a lobby, but sometimes it does not load you into the spectator mode for some reason. I hope it gets fixed. It's a current trend that Japanese console games get ported more and more to PC, especially in niche genres, where I would number fighting games among. I think Soul Calibur is one of the last big series finally getting a PC port and as a PC player I was quite happy just about finally seeing it on Steam. So this game is probably my least rational choice. I think several fighting game series had some trouble with single player content in the past too, especially the release version of Street Fighter V. But Soul Calibur delivered a lot of single player content right at release. About its quality can be argued since most of the stories are told with stills and a bit of voice acting. The second story mode called Libra of Soul only has stills and text without voice acting at all, but some interesting other elements. Of course, I see that's not for everyone and I haven't put too much time into it as well. Still, you have the other story mode where you explore the stories of all the characters. For a fighting game it's okay and the stories told in this genre were rarely truly great. Soul Calibur 6 has one new mechanic I dislike, the so called reversal edge. It's a slow defensive attack that can be charged into an unblockable and it automatically blocks almost everything during its active frames. It does almost no damage but if it hits you, time is slowed down and both players can press a button, resulting in a more complex rock paper scissors scenario. Each character has some combo potential on one choice, so you also have some mind games going on. You can also just block or sidestep. Blocking, however, costs a ridiculous amount of so-called guard stamina, which can lead to guard breaks. Maybe its intent is to give new players a tool similar to the guard impact, which is a well-timed block plus a direction input, like a parry, that creates a similar situation. I personally hate reversal edge because it disturbs the flow of combat and even though it's easy to sidestep and heavily punish, it's annoying and should it hit you can totally kill your momentum and mess with your positioning. In addition, it gives a ton of meter. So what's meter? Similar to the Street Fighter series where it started with Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, there's a gauge that fills and can be spent for a super move or something called Soul Charge, which improves all your moves for a short period of time. Like some V-triggers in Street Fighter V. This bar is often called meter. A problem I see with reversal edge is that if you can exploit it a lot, you generate up to two full bars in one round, which is a bit ridiculous. Still, there is counterplay and it can be heavily punished. You also don't need to use it. However, some characters have a reversal edge integrated into some of their basic combos, which I find annoying too. I personally never use it and got quite good at punishing it, but it's still not fun and the game would not be worse without it in my opinion. I also hope that they make it generate less meter at some point. On release also some characters were quite good if you could use them, like Ivy, but overall I would say the balance was good for new and average players in a newly released game. Nothing that could not be patched and we already got a balance patch. Of course, there are some characters newer players complain constantly about, but that's true for almost all fighting games, I guess. Another critical point is the length of the critical edge move, the super move. Pun intended. They look cool, but after 10 hours they start to become a chore. Reversal Edge has the same problem. But overall, Soul Calibur 6 is a really good fighting game package that's easier to get into and see some success than most other fighting games. Still, it can happen when you play online, even ranked, that you get matched against some top players who will absolutely destroy you. Some people complain about this, but I actually like this to happen from time to time because you can learn a lot from these fights, especially what moves and habits can get punished if the other player knows what he's doing. I always see those fights as free fighting game lessons, but you need of course the right mindset for this, which I also sometimes don't have. And getting frustrated in competitive games is part of the experience. The training mode is good too and has almost everything you could wish for except for frame data, which is sadly typical for Bandai Namco games. 
hint for stage reset on keyboard press the K and L key at the same time. It's not explained in the game. You can't change this even if you change the original key layout on PC. On console it's R1 and L1 or RB and LB I guess. I played it for about 120 hours and had a ton of fun with it. Netcode can be off at times and there can be some strange interactions that will potentially frustrate you from time to time but overall I loved it and can fully recommend the game. If you are into character customization the game has less clothing options than Soul Calibur 5 and maybe Soul Calibur 4 but you can still do a lot. So why Soul Calibur 6 and not Dragon Ball Fighters? I think it comes down to preference. I'm not the biggest fan of the tag team concept in fighting games. They tend to become a cluster of colors and effects. Of course you can get used to it and it fits Dragon Ball perfectly but I prefer a bit less and Soul Calibur is exactly that. Still over the top but clean. You have flashy moves too but not that flashy. Still Dragon Ball Fighters is an amazing game too that looks absolutely beautiful and could have easily made it into my list instead when it would be my cup of tea. Also shoutouts to Super Smash Bros Ultimate which I could play briefly with some friends recently. 2018 was definitely another good year for fighting game fans. My number 2 of 2018 would be surprise Sea of Thieves. I made a long video about this game and what content means but let me explain why I think it's actually that good. I hadn't that much fun in a video game for a long time. I also must admit that Rare did a stellar job in supporting the game after launch. Fixing many bugs but also keeping some because they turned out to be fun like the sword dash through water. They changed a lot of gameplay elements and added content too plus their community communication is exemplary. However Sea of Thieves is a strange game. It's even hard to actually put into a genre. The game is not an MMO but a multiplayer game with good co-op. This is also the game's strongest part and it heavily clashes with the different preferences and wishes for video game progression of many players. It encourages a creative playstyle. Without that it's probably mediocre or let's say it gets boring very fast because all you would do is grind the same few boring missions over and over to unlock some nonsensical cosmetics and pointless ranks. And while recent patches gave more diversity it still won't satisfy all players wishes. But what's the fun of the game then? It's stealing from other players like a pirate and that's exactly what I want from a pirate game. In this game the player writes his own story and goals. You are the content creator. A strange example. After players fought on that special island with a fort on it for over an hour to get its treasures, defending against other player ships passing by with the same goal and finally being victorious, I simply sneaked on their ship, dropped two of their most valuable treasures overboard, escaped and sold them myself. They never even knew I was there until they would sell their stuff at an outpost. And it felt great but somehow I also felt a bit bad for them. In Sea of Thieves when you get robbed it can feel terrible but if you rob others it feels good but also a bit terrible. Only few games give you that feeling and I guess that's part of playing a pirate. The game is a giant sandbox in the widest sense that gives you tools to have fun with other players, even daring to potentially ruin the fun for others this time. If people ask me what I do in this game I would say as a solo player I play a lot of hide and seek. To be successful at it you need information and knowledge of the game. You need to know where to hide on each of the three ship types. You need to evaluate what mission they are on, where on the ship they will likely go after completing it and when it's time to escape with a treasure or attack. For example when they do a skeleton fort finding gunpowder is very likely which players usually store at the crow's nest because if it explodes there the ship's hull does not get damaged and it's out of reach for boarding players because getting to the crow's nest can be easily prevented if the crew notice a boarding pirate. So hiding there would be a bad idea if the crow nest is empty. They will most likely climb up at some point and see you by accident. Also knowing where you are on the map is helpful too for your escape plans especially when playing alone. So a hiding spot close to the map is really good. 
Another element is the game's amazing sound design. The game avoids providing information through a user interface, except for ammunition, HP, player names and interactive options available that require pressing a button and provide it through visual details and very distinguishable sounds. Our sails in the wind is someone climbing up the ladder, moving the anchor, moving the sails, reloading, even using the telescope being attacked by a shark or being drunk. You can hear it. And it's not only for atmosphere, but a crucially important part of PvP. Climbing up a ladder is quite difficult, because the sound getting out of the water is very noticeable. So you try to time your climb when other sounds are around, like gun or cannon fire. And over time you develop your own strategies and techniques for boarding, but also defending a ship. It has a surprising amount of depth, which is of course sometimes not intentional, like the mentioned sword dash that can help you moving faster through the water. It's a little and long known bug, but the devs decided to not patch it out, because they thought it was a cool little trick. However, the game gives every player the same chance. There are no stat bonuses. When you destroy other crews, it's due to your knowledge and ability to play the game, not because your level is higher. There are plenty of successful games out there that do the same. For example, Dota, League of Legends, Starcraft, Street Fighter, Tekken or Counter-Strike. In every match you start at zero again and only your skill makes a difference. Same in this game. For sure it's not the best shooter and not the best sword fighting game, but the combination plus the amazing ship combat is what makes it outstanding in my opinion. An interesting contrast is Atlas. There you can build, craft, upgrade and level up. And many players love this. But it also bears the danger of bigger guilds or better equipped and leveled ones destroying you and your base, resulting in potentially losing a lot of what you have grinded so hard for a long time. Of course, this can also be appealing. Both games have two very different concepts for very different player preferences. It also helps that Sea of Thieves is technically a very polished and clean game to avoid some frustration. However, a problem Sea of Thieves has, there is no scoreboard. You can do the greatest heists, maneuvers and robberies, but nobody or only few will notice. There is no rank ladder, nothing that documents your success and ability. Servers are too small and not consistent, so it's hard for your name to be remembered, which leads to you doing all you do in the game for yourself. That's enough for me, plus I usually record it or tell my friends about my adventures. But if that's not enough for you, Sea of Thieves is most likely not your game, at least in the long run. Another problem I noticed, pacing problems. If you interact, fight or mess with other players, the game shines and is a ton of fun, especially the naval combat. You have to even consider the wave movement of the water when aiming your cannons and the waves are synchronized on the server. Resources are an important factor too and you can really get creative getting them. But when you just load into the game, you have to sometimes search for other players like 10 to 20 minutes and it's not that much fun. It also leads to a lot of connecting, disconnecting and connecting again to switch servers and find players and conditions you like. I hope this will be fixed in the announced arena mode coming soon. Still, when those moments happen, everything goes as you planned, you outplay other players and you find creative and interesting tricks to fight. The game is intense and so much fun, especially with friends, but also solo and I played solo a lot. Despite some of its flaws, it's probably the most fun I had with any game and my most played game this year. Now we come to my game of the year 2018. Game-wise, 2018 was a good and interesting year. Games like God of War and Red Dead Redemption 2 demonstrated how far the art of animation and the motion capture technology has come, combined with professional voice acting, acting and impressively detailed graphics, AAA games like these set a new mark for the graphics, animation and narrative arts in gaming. Even though I'm not able to say if Uncharted 4 wasn't on almost the same level two years earlier, those two games who lead many Game of the Year lists at least reached this mark again. 
What can be noted in this regard, most AAA games also focus on being cinematic experiences and having a ton of content in addition as discussed in my video about Sea of Thieves and what content means. These games even have screenshot modes so people can create proof of their virtual beauty and share them with others. Then inside these games we find immersive and emotional moments built on the fundament of fitting music. This often happens in cutscenes. Occasionally games have very seamless transitions from cutscene to game or some playable mechanic inside a cutscene. Back in the day quick time events were quite popular for this. 2018's God of War worked on its old quick time event design, reducing the amount massively, making many optional and interestingly also extremely reducing the number of QTE fail states, which is in harmony with the development of QTEs in bigger games I guess, which is getting rid of them. So for me personally an improvement. Still, cutscenes are often just little film snippets we watch and you play the game in between. God of War avoids complex narrative elements while the player is inside combat, its main game mechanical focus, and often switches between gameplay and cutscene in a well designed choreography and pace so you don't even notice. While for example in Metal Gear Solid 4 you put your controller down for half an hour. In God of War's first fight against the stranger you don't have time for that, it's well designed. In this we also see the tendency of AAA developers to increase cinematic elements in their video games to a point where it became the standard for those and their narrative. This is of course nothing new. My comparison to Metal Gear Solid comes not from nowhere because it can be argued that the first Metal Gear Solid from 1998 on PlayStation 1 started this trend, so it's Hideo Kojima's and his team's fault. Now 20 years later the New York Times praised Red Dead Redemption 2 as true art because of the high quality of its cinematic elements, visuals and cinematic feel in combination with the player making some decisions in the game. But for me this article raised some questions. Why makes mimicking an established art form a game more art than actually focusing on the element that differentiates the two art forms from each other? Why aren't beautiful game designs we find in games like Deus Ex which is truly about decisions, Age of Empires 2, Starcraft, Dota or Super Metroid considered art by the wider audience? All of those games ooze of complex and fun game design. For example a game I played a lot this year was Age of Empires 2 HD which I also played when I was a kid, so in the late 90s. Looking at it from my today's perspective I am still impressed how well designed and complex it is. Sadly it seems to not get the same recognition being true art. You could argue it's due to popularity but games like Dota 2 are highly popular and nothing than complex and well executed game design in its purest form. But it's rarely called art. Maybe it comes down to age, the medium film is young but video games are even younger. There were debates about film being art too and not always is art recognized by a wider audience. Can you imagine that Citizen Kane did not get the Best Picture Academy Award in 1942? It only got Best Original Screenplay and legends say that parts of the audience booed every time Orson Welles name was said. Of course some also realized how good his film was but it ultimately flopped. Over the next 18 years this view would drastically change and people understood how revolutionary and important it was for the medium film and it's considered one of the best films ever made now. The reason why Citizen Kane flopped and destroyed Wells career are political, complex and worth its own video. Maybe Citizen Kane is also a bad example, but there are tons of others. Alfred Hitchcock, Akira Kurosawa, Sergio Leone or Stanley Kubrick come to my mind, all counted towards the greatest film directors of all time. None got the best director at that time and only Hitchcock's Rebecca got the Oscar for the best picture. The films that got the awards instead are also extremely good but often lack the impact on the art itself in film history. Kurosawa single handedly invented whole subgenres and heavily influenced one of the biggest film franchises, Star Wars, which was of film historic relevance itself.
So not always the most important creators and works get the award, which has many reasons. In film, beyond Hollywood politics, which probably play an important role, there is maybe a part of those filmmakers' art that people have trouble to fully understand or appreciate in their respective present time. And I think this could be similar with games. Of course, people knew the genius of those men, even back in their day, and critics praised their films but even nowadays it takes some time to explain why Citizen Kane is considered one of the best films ever made. For most people it's just a very boring film. I have the theory that it has to do with what I call focus of the emotion and to some extent focus of the spectacle, which is related. How Green Was My Valley, the film that won the Oscar for Best Picture, Director, Cinematography plus some others in 1942 against Citizen Kane is the more emotional and for that time relatable film. Most films and games these days focus on generating emotions in their audience too. Rarely do they focus on other concepts. I personally like the focus of the idea, which of course does not exclude emotion. Blade Runner 2049, which sadly flopped, comes to my mind as a recent example, but also Citizen Kane is a very rational film, which only transforms the idea into emotion very slowly, especially in its context, including the consequences of it. Blade Runner has both two, emotion and ideas. I guess the hard sci-fi genre didn't help too much too. The difference is that a stronger focus on emotion is a more relaxed and relatable experience for the viewer. You can be immersed and the emotion just happens. For example, in Red Dead Redemption 2, it's fun just walking around and being immersed by its depiction of nature. In contrast, after seeing Citizen Kane the first time, I thought about this film a lot and read about its history and context over the course of several weeks and that also developed emotion, feeling set for wells. A thing that many people often don't have time and motivation for in these difficult and busy times. So those who control the power of immersion, emotion and spectacle the best will win. A partially exception from our time in film is probably Christopher Nolan, who manages to find a perfect balance between ideas and emotion, transforming ideas into emotion in powerful twists and scenes without losing the viewer. Beyond that, as mentioned, we also live in a time of franchising. George Lucas' Star Wars probably started all this. One of his main inspirations for his old space opera trilogy was Akira Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress from 1958. Shoutouts to the user in my comments who brought this up recently. Search for Hidden Fortress and Star Wars and you will find a comparison. While praised, Hidden Fortress would be overshadowed by the success of Lucas Star Wars films in the public perception 19 years later. This and other similar important films were also not franchised. I would argue most of these types of films aren't franchise material. Of course, the focus of emotion is nothing bad. It's an art too, but it seems the balance was lost over time and the art of generating emotion is very well explored and understood by filmmakers. Not much new is happening there. Sequels and franchising are also nothing evil. I'm a big fan of Tolkien who wrote The Lord of the Rings as some kind of sequel to The Hobbit. Still, many popular art forms are heavily dominated by it, at least in today's mainstream, which in my opinion leads to the problem that stories take far too long to end or often don't really end at all because the sequel is already planned. Writing a good end is difficult and many good films just end. Can you imagine Citizen Kane 2? Would make no sense. Imagine The Seven Samurai Part 2 never happened because it has already told what it wanted to tell and Kurosawa went on. If we look at the highest grossing films of all time, we find a handful of exceptions like Titanic, but most of them are part of franchises or will be transformed into one. We also see this in gaming for a long time, which has learned a lot of film. I have the theory that one of many reasons for this heavy franchising focus are the ridiculous long copyright protection times up to over 100 years, which removes pressure for creating new IPs. 
So considering film history, we see similarities, tendencies, but also differences. Metal Gear Solid was a highly successful game and part of a franchise, but also important for the development of the medium video games. But that came out 20 years ago and even there the trend of sequels was already there. As said, video games almost always looked at what film is doing. Now after this far too long excursus we finally come to my game of the year 2018 which in my opinion does something truly special as a focus on the idea, has an ending and expands an old concept further using the main differences between game and film as a medium which is interactivity. I can't say if this game will be important for the development of the medium yet but it could have some impact on narratives in games later. And this also shows my personal preferences. Sequel potential and a focus on emotion and narratives are not that important to me. I love the idea and unusual concepts well executed which will be reflected by my choice. My game of the year 2018 is Return of the Obra Dinn. It's only available on PC and Mac right now and was developed by Lucas Pope who developed it almost alone and is known for Papers, Please, another unusual indie game which makes controlling passports an emotional roller coaster through ideas, narrative and especially game design. Oberdin is hard to put into a genre. I would say it's an adventure puzzle game in the widest sense but let me explain. The game is about a ship called Obra Dinn from the 19th century. It went on a voyage and was lost to unknown reasons. After some years it reappears but with no crew on board, a ghost ship. Your task is now to find out what happened to it and the crew. For this you have a list with all 60 crew members including passengers, some sketches of the crew plus plans of the ship and you must find out their fate. Identifying people is a big part of it. To help you doing this you have a few tools with the main one being a small pocket watch that has a supernatural ability to show you the moment of death of a corpse you find in an illusion or flashback I guess where time is frozen and you can move around plus you hear the sound of the last let's say 10 seconds. Also the game confirms every three correct entries in your book. Beyond that it has this really unusual visual style. Basically you watch people die which is a bit strange and sometimes quite brutal. But what's so special about this game? Now we come to what I said prior. While other games simply show you cutscenes so little or sometimes bigger film snippets to tell the story bit and then move on often without much attention needed in this game the cutscenes are the main part of the actual gameplay. You not simply watch them. You have to truly understand them and every detail in depth to play through the game without guessing and playing without too much guessing is the fun part of the game. While film simply tells stories, sometimes more complex and some films can be understood without looking for details too. Return of the Obradin uses what is unique to the medium game which is interactivity. So in this game basically movement, some UIs and the mind of the player in combination with audio visual elements, the cutscenes, to let the player play through the game and tell the story. Almost every fate can be identified by combining the information logically. Of course you have to make assumptions or educated guesses at times but you are able to actually identify everyone and you feel like a genius doing so. I try to explain this without too many spoilers and just show you what is also in the demo of the game. You hear these men talk. Captain, open the door. Kick it in. Ah, lest we break it down and take more than those shells. You bastards may take exactly what I give you. And you notice that one of them has a Scottish accent. If you now check the book you see there are only four Scottish people on board. The first mate, the purser, a female passenger and a top man. If we look at the uniform we see it must be a male crew member of higher rank. This excludes the woman and the top man. So first mate and purser are left. 
if we now look at the sketch of the crew, we see the man standing next to the guy with a big hat in the front. And he said, Captain, open the door. So that must be the captain and he is most likely the first mate. If we look further into it, we also notice something else, but I won't spoil too much and indeed you will identify the first mate at least in the next two memories for sure, if you don't do it in this scene already. The game gamifies and transcends the cutscene to a new level, where not only following some story is important, but extracting as much information as possible. Your mind needs to pierce through every scene. Many little details are placed masterfully, so that you have to walk and look around to actually find them. With all this, the game has a clear focus of the idea and transforms it potentially into emotion when you uncover more and more. It's one thing when character X explains that character Y is evil and he maybe does something shockingly evil a bit later in the narrative. But it's more mind blowing and intense if you actually find it out yourself, revealing a character's intention that actually nobody knew about at all on the ship and this information would be lost forever without you and your research. So you definitely know more than the characters of the game. I think the focus of the idea is not uncommon in gaming because a big part of games are rules and mechanics which often transport ideas. By including more and more film elements of our time for the narrative, this probably changed a bit for some games that focus on storytelling first. For example, we often see many disconnects from the game's narrative and its gameplay. Some call it Ludo narrative dissonance. In Uncharted, we play this nice guy, Nathan Drake, who has killed several hundred people through his journeys. A hero versus being a mass murderer. In Red Dead Redemption 2 or God of War, we find some minor disconnects too, as in many other games. It happens when game mechanics get in the way of storytelling. Mechanics need to be fun, the player needs to be challenged, but also needs some powers. Then in the story or you could say in the screenplay, a character will be captured by the enemies and suddenly the player loses control in a cutscene. His played character forgets everything he has learned and done so far just watching it happening, while you want to slap him in the face through the screen. We all know these moments and in my opinion it has to do with differences between the medium film and game. Sometimes fun mechanics do not fit the story and while some games manage to reduce it, Obradin solves this problem extremely well and elegant because the cutscenes are part of the core game mechanics. When replaying the game you will also notice how early it's sometimes possible to identify some crew members and how early you can learn something that you will most likely miss or learn much later otherwise. And as you play, the game starts to draw a more precise picture of the situation and almost all characters, their background and intentions in your head than you would ever have by simply watching classical cutscenes. You learn some details beyond the crew list depending on how good you are. And when finally everything unfolds in front of your mind, it's a really mind blowing experience. The game takes itself seriously and the voice acting is really good too. It has subtitles for other languages. The story is not insanely complex, but how masterfully the details are placed and woven into the game and game design is a true achievement. There are somewhat similar games like Her Story, but Oberdin is still very different because you can move around in the scenes and visuals are more important than just the dialogues. What's interesting, this could to some degree be integrated in almost all games with cutscenes and it could improve some of them or give them a bit of fresh air. Of course, there are references, easter eggs and little secrets hidden in little details that most people won't notice in other games and even films too. But Obradin's concept goes further by gamifying cutscenes and the narrative. It must also be noted that the game provides not much ability wise, so what you primarily need to play through the game is actually part of the player's real life abilities, not the game's. It only supports the player with overviews and tools, helping the player to sort things out. 
and even though there are 60 people on the list, you won't lose track if you stick to the game. At least that was the case for me and I feared that Lucas Pope potentially could not solve this problem. A longer break between play sessions could give you a hard time though, so I recommend playing through it without longer breaks. I needed about 10 hours to play through it, counting breaks where I didn't close the game and I could have done it faster but I avoided guessing as much as possible and recorded some stuff. After I finished it I was sad because I had such a great time with it but the story is told and has ended. I would not be surprised, not to say I would expect, seeing Lucas Pope just moving on to another unrelated project and develop his art further. In my opinion Return of the Ober Din is a true masterpiece that could potentially influence its medium one day or not, only time will tell. Red Dead Redemptions or God of Wars art is probably easier to appreciate and understand, but for me Return of the Ober Din is true art too. Thank you for watching. This video got far too long and maybe I got a bit lost in the film part but I loved writing it. I hope you liked it too and I could bring my point and reasoning through. If you liked it feel free to leave a comment and press the like button. Feel free to check my other content too. In case you want to subscribe consider pressing the bell because I upload once a week at best so YouTube likes to skip notifications when I upload a new video. Next will be a Tolkien law related video as mentioned before. I try to be faster this time. Maybe I'll make a new games coming 2019 video but I don't know yet. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.